let f of t have a Laplace transform capital F of s. I've written down the definition here as a reminder. I'm also going to be using the Heaviside step function. It's the function capital H of t that turns on a constant value, usually taken to be 1, to the right of the value t equals 0. So h of t is 0 to the left of the vertical axis and 1 to the right. By multiplying it by a function, it can be used to turn on that function at the axis. The Heaviside function is also known as the step function because of its resemblance to a step. Sometimes, though, we want to move the step over to the right somewhere, to a point t equals a, for instance. That means shifting the Heaviside function, making it h of t minus a, just a horizontal shift on the t. So now it looks like this. h of t minus a is sometimes referred to also as h suffix a of t. Multiplying a function f of t by h of t minus a turns the function on at a. Sometimes, though, that's not what we want. Sometimes we want to actually shift the function so that the original shape is turned on at a. Look at the following. First of all, just a plain old function y equals f of t, with a shape that I've drawn at random. Now look at the next one. Multiplying by h of t minus a has had the effect of turning the function off until we get to a, but then turning on the function in its original shape at a. Sometimes that's not what we want. Sometimes we want to shift the whole function over to the right, so that the, the original shape actually starts at a. To do that, we use the following formula. Here, the effect of the t minus a as the argument of f is to move the whole shape over. Then, the effect of the h of t minus a is to make sure that we don't have any of the f to the left of a, that it actually starts at a. The second shift theorem tells us how to find the Laplace transform of this third version, h of t minus a, f of t minus a. I'll write down now what the shift theorem tells us, then I'm going to prove it. To avoid complications with the integration, we'll take a to be positive. Try to memorise the right-hand side, because I might need to refer to it as I'm doing the calculation, after it's disappeared off the top screen. What we need to do is to write down the definition of the Laplace transform for the function on the left, the one containing h and f. It's just the standard definition. Multiply the original function by e to the negative st, and integrate from zero to infinity. But now, that heavy side step function is multiplying not just f, but also the exponential. It's multiplying everything in the integrand. That means that it turns on those functions only at a. So long as a is over to the right, that is, positive, any part of the integration starting at zero, as far as a, will have a zero integrand, so will not contribute. So in fact, we can change our integration limit here to start at a rather than zero. OK, that was easy enough. Now we've got to think about where we're aiming for. Do you remember I asked you to memorise the right... Actually, you can still see it there. e to the minus a s f of s. If we're to get capital F of s out of this expression, then somehow we need to have a little f of t without the a in it. We can achieve that by doing a substitution. Let's choose u equals t minus a. That will account for both the t minus a's in our integrand. But we also need to deal with the dt. That's easy, though. Just take the differentials on each side. du equals dt, because a is constant. But then also, in that exponential, there is a t without the a being subtracted. So we need an expression for t in terms of u. That's also easy. Just rearrange the top line. t equals u plus a. That's enough to turn our integrand entirely over to the variable u. But we still have to deal with the limits. The limits, as they are seen at the moment, are limits for t. 
we need to explore the consequences of those limits for u. Now when t is equal to the bottom limit a, a minus a is 0 and so u will be 0. So that means that 0 will be the lower limit on my new integral once I write it all in terms of u. For the top limit, when t gets very big, so does u. So both go to infinity together. Hence the top limit will be unchanged, still positive infinity. Let's do the substitution now completely to u. First the integral symbol, then the exponential. Remember there we've got to change t to u plus a. Then in the rest of the integrand, t minus a is just changed to u, and dt is du. OK so far? Now look at the integration limit, 0 to infinity. But the capital H turns on the stuff in the integral at 0. To the right of 0, capital H is just 1. So in effect, we can change it to 1. Or in other words, we might as well just drop that h of u now. Next, I'm going to break that exponential up into a product of two separate exponentials, e to the minus su and e to the minus sa. But then, since neither s nor a depend on u, that second part of the exponential is a constant as far as the integration is concerned, so it can be pulled to the front. And now, what is left there in that integral is really just the Laplace transform of little f again. OK, it's written in terms of u, but u is what's known as a dummy variable. Its name does not matter, since limits for the values of u are being put in, 0 to infinity, doesn't matter whether we're putting them in for something called u or something called t. So let's now change the name of u back to t. Then we see that what we've got sitting there is just the Laplace transform of little f. Please understand, though, that I've written that last line just to make it look familiar as the Laplace transform. This t is not the same t that we had before, but the expression is the Laplace transform of f. But what we've now achieved is the right-hand side of the second shift theorem. In other words, we have proved the theorem. Here it was, indicated with the red arrow. In mathematics, when we've proved a theorem, it's often a convention to write QED afterwards to indicate that the proof is finished. That stands for the Latin words quadrat demonstrandum, or in other words, that which was to be demonstrated. I'd like to finish this recording with a simple example. Let's take f of t equal to t, a simple linear function whose Laplace transform we either know or, if we can't remember it, it's easy to look up. It's just 1 over s squared. Now I'm going to take that function f and shift it, let's say, 3 units to the right. So this shows the shift and the fact that this function is now turned on starting from t equals 3. The formula for the new function is also shown here. It's exactly the kind of function that we've been dealing with under the second shift theorem. So now I can easily write down the Laplace transform for this new function. If I give that function the name little g of t, then we can call the Laplace transform capital G of s. And since now the thing we called a before has been set equal to 3, the second shift theorem just tells us to multiply the original f of s, that's the 1 over s squared we can see above, with the exponential of negative 3s. And that's done. It really is that simple. I'm going to stop there.